Today's Harvest Growth podcast guest took an existing technology, modified it to a different market or audience, and grew his business to well over seven figures. Today, he shares the key marketing strategies and tactics that he's using that's growing his business at 50% per year. Are you looking for new ways to make your sales grow? You've tried other podcasts, but they don't seem to know. Harvest the growth potential of your product or service as we share stories and strategies that'll make your competitors nervous. Now, here's the host of the Harvest Growth Podcast, John LeClaire. Welcome back to the show. I'm really excited to be speaking with Alec Archangelski today. He's the CEO and co-founder of BreakFreeTech.com. Check out their website. You'll, we'll hear more about the product today, but it's a super cool product. You got to see the visuals of it to really understand it. But Alex, I want to jump in and give you the chance to really describe what is the BreakFree product, the BreakFree Light that you developed. Yeah, absolutely. So BreakFree essentially is a um, product that makes motorcyclists much more visible out on the road. It's the simplest way to increase your visibility. It's a product that attaches to the motorcycle helmet, any motorcycle helmet for that matter. Um, just a simple mount sticks on the back of the helmet. You click the product in, turn it on, and that's it. It's got all the built-in sensors. Um, it's got over 100 LEDs, uh, super bright, wide-angle views. So real simple, real straightforward way to increase your visibility a ton. I personally love this product. I'm not a motorcycle rider myself, but I do ride road bikes. And you know, the, although the specific problems might be a little bit different, awareness of drivers, you know, so them seeing us on the road is, is very similar. So I use a product, again, very, a little different from yours, which it's a sensor that sees them coming. It notifies me. So when cars are about to pass you, cause I'm on the side of the road, not in the middle of the road, like, like you are with a motorcycle and it's, man, it's been a game changer. I've been using that for a couple of years. I can see that this on, on motorcycles specifically, again, on road bikes, I'm not really breaking too often. I get very different, but on the motorcycle, that's where you've really got to watch out for motorcyclists in front and around you when they start to slow down and you may not see the small light that, that comes on the motorcycle. So yeah, kudos to you. I, I just, I'm glad you came up with this really to help the safety of other motorcycle riders out, out there. Can you talk to us about your, your origin story? how did you originally develop this product? Yeah, absolutely. So the product actually came together as a kind of by, by chance, honestly. Um, I graduated from San Jose State back in 2013. And after I graduated with my bachelor's in uh, business and focused on entrepreneurship, I really wanted to dive in to the entrepreneurial space because that was super interesting to me. And um, I asked my um, business plan class professor to see if maybe she can get me into an internship with an entrepreneur or a startup where I can just kind of learn and uh, get my hands dirty. And so she did that and connected me with an entrepreneur that's been at it for a long time. He was kind of towards the end of his career. He's an alum from San Jose State. And uh, he was working on a bunch of different projects. And one of the projects that he just kind of had an idea, um, purchased the prototype, and then wanted to see if there's a market fit. That's where I came in. It was this light bar for cars. That was kind of his idea. He wanted to add an extra bit of visibility for cars when they're slamming on their brakes and the regular brake lights aren't enough. So that's kind of where the whole thing kind of started. So it wasn't entirely my idea, but um, what I've contributed to it was the research and we've gone through, um, I've interviewed a lot of different people. I've um, researched all the different products that have kind of attempted to do something similar. Um, the conclusion that I came up with is car drivers already have a lot of visibility. They already have the third brake light on the uh, center of the window. They've got uh, lights on the left and right. Most car drivers feel fairly safe inside their car. They don't necessarily need a product like that. And um, being a motorcycle rider myself at that point, I've been commuting to San Jose State on my motorcycle. I've been riding since I was 20 years old. And I'm 37 now. So, you know, for, for record. And uh, so to me, it was, you know, it was obvious that something like that needed to exist for motorcycle riders more so than it needed to exist for car drivers. So then I suggested a pivot after that, you know, did a little bit of work with uh, that entrepreneur and our internship kind of concluded and he wasn't going to continue with the product because he's close to 70 years old at that point And never ridden a motorcycle in his life. He had no interest in 
learning this whole new industry that he wasn't really that excited about. And so I asked him if maybe we can take this on together as him being my mentor and, and guide me in the right direction. And I wanted to see it to the end. And so that's kind of how it started. And I love that story. And I think, you know, so many inventors, if they, if they pull an idea from someone else and modify it, they don't feel like they invented it. But in reality, you know, I love, there's a, I don't know a quote exactly, but Thomas Edison talks about this where, you know, he obviously invented thousands of things that we still use today, right? Uh, you know, groundbreaking inventions, but he talked about how, how none of them were from scratch, right? They were, they were taken, it was the next step in innovation, taking an existing product and making it better or altering its purpose. Like in your case, you, the technology was there, but what I love about that story is you identified the bigger problem, right? So really successful products are solutions to problems that people face, right? And in the car, as you mentioned, I, you know, who, who are we to say necessarily, right? But you did some research on this. I, it seems to me also like a, a very minor problem with the lights that are around it, uh, especially relative to motorcycles, but a huge problem for motorcycle riders. So, you know, took that to, the, to a, a better market, I think, in, in this case, and, you know, identified really the problem to solve and, to me, that that is true invention, right? Finding a taking a, a technology but modifying it for a, for a better purpose. So kudos to you. Thank you. I a part of what I understand about your story also is that you spent a lot of time in getting to simplicity, right? So how this works. Um, so for the consumer, and I'll let you describe exactly how it works a little bit further, but. Um, it, it's super easy, right? And that is almost a necessity, especially for technology products, making it easy for the end user. But in the engineering and development phase, it can be so difficult to get to simplicity, right? So for you, it can be difficult to, to make this just right and easy for, for the end user to use. How did you achieve that? I guess maybe just describe a little bit more about the process and how easy it is to install, use you know, functionality in general. Yeah, absolutely. So the product itself is using built-in sensors, microprocessor, everything's built into the unit itself. It's running our algorithm that we've developed and customized specifically for motorcycle use, um, where the product detects uh, the inertial force of braking and is able to use other sensors to filter out all the other things that are not braking. So if you're just using a simple accelerometer, that's going to have a lot of um, issues. It's going to have a lot of false positives because to an accelerometer, gravity is acceleration. You slowing down is acceleration. You going around a corner, that's also acceleration. So we had to, um, we had to make this work. And in the process, you know, that's how I found my co-founders is I'm not a technical person. I wouldn't have been able to do this on my own. We needed to have good industrial design and we needed to have somebody that was able to create this vision of what I wanted uh, into reality through hardware and, and algorithms and things like that. So um, the process was quite um, quite long actually um, for us to get this right. Um, but the way the final product works is that you just attach something to your head, uh, to your helmet. It's a simple plastic mount. You take our product, you turn it on, clip it into the mount, and that's it. It does. It's everything is, you don't have to worry about it at all. It's just yeah. something that's kind of watching your back as you're riding. It's not to, and it's not meant to eliminate accidents altogether, but it's meant to elevate your visibility to the next level. Um, on motorcycles, as you mentioned, um, there's only one brake light typically, and it's really dim and it's out of eye level for car drivers. And in general, you know, car drivers are not looking for motorcycle riders because we're only 3% of the vehicles out there on the road. So most of the time, if you're driving, you're looking for car lights, you're looking for that big shape and you're not used to seeing motorcyclists. So we're kind of invisible on the road. So adding a, a brake light up high onto the helmet, it puts that, it, it kind of mimics the third brake light of a car that doesn't exist for uh, motorcycle riders. Plus adding additional light source for a motorcycle rider um, help, uh, helps with uh, depth perception as well quite a bit so that you can actually tell what the object in front of you is doing, whether it's slowing down by getting closer or if it's getting further away with one light source, you can't really quite tell. So um, yeah, the product is really simple. Everything's built in. You just turn it on. That's it. And if you forget to turn it off, it'll fall asleep on you. Once you pick up the helmet, the accelerometer will detect the motion. It'll turn back on. So we really try to make this product as simple as possible because 
there's been um, a number of attempts at this kind of idea in the past. And I think the shortfall has been really added complexity and installation and um, just not really thinking it through all the logical steps of how a person might use something like this. Uh, most motorcycle riders um, either have multiple bikes or multiple helmets. So having a solution um, like currently, you know, if you look up on Amazon helmet brake light, you'll probably see a whole bunch of cheap little lights. And most of them you have to wire into the motorcycle. There's a little uh, RF transmitter that sends a signal to the helmet light to turn on every time you're hitting the brakes. Um, so one, the installation is complex. It takes a little bit of time to get that done. I've tested it myself. It took me about 60 minutes to get one of these wired up. My motorcycle at the time was a very cheap one. So if I screwed up the wiring, it's not a big deal. A lot of customers uh, have really nice bikes. And so if they screwed up, uh, wiring on a BMW or Ducati that costs some thousands yeah. of dollars for a product that cost them $50 to initially purchase. That's not really a, a great outcome either. So I saw that as a barrier um, to a lot of customers for actually get, getting this out there. Cause I've, I've personally, I've never seen these solutions that are out there um, on Amazon or Alibaba in the real world. Like as I'm riding around, I've never seen them around. So I, I was asking myself, why, why is that happening? So I think that, you know, I, I, it's, it's a bit of guesswork, but, you know, I think that that, that installation step is one, two is, uh, if you stick something on your helmet, you need to be able to take it off and put it on your other helmet. Or if you have a passenger, you don't want to be blinding them. So you want to be able to take it off your helmet, put it on their helmet. So the mounting solution, um, was another, and, um, just the accuracy of how the device is detecting breaking, um, how quickly it responds. That's another important piece. Uh, on motorcycles, as opposed to cars, um, when you let off the throttle, the motorcycle slows down quite a bit due to engine braking. And uh, when you downshift, the motorcycle slows down quite a bit. Um, for example, like Teslas do that kind of thing. Um, when you let off the throttle, the regenerative braking slows the car down quite a bit, but not in regular cars. So when you have a solution that's wired into your brake system and you let off the throttle, you're not using the brakes so your lights aren't turning on. Our product, because it's sensor-based, it's able to detect that deceleration as well. And it's giving the drivers behind you more information on what you're actually doing. When you're slowing down by engine braking, your brake lights aren't on, but brake free will let people know behind you that you're actually slowing down. So there's that benefit as well. Hmm, that's fantastic. So uh, again, we talked about the product, love it, the development piece of it. Let's talk about the success you've had now. So this, you know, because of the problems you're solving, because of this, you know, you noticed a real gap in the marketplace and, and solved it in an ingenious and simplistic or simple way, not simplistic, in a very simple way for consumers. So the business was launched just a couple of years ago. So around 2020 and very early on, you raised about a quarter million dollars through crowdfunding um, and then move, we'll get into your success since then. You've really grown the business since then, but that was the first step. What would you say was the biggest driver of success uh, on the, for crowdfunding for you to be able to raise that money initially? Um, I think that there's a lot of different elements. Uh, one, it's kind of raising the awareness of what you're doing currently. So we've done quite a few uh, podcast appearances uh, prior to our launch, kind of talking about, hey, we're, we're developing this product. Um, this is uh, going to launch uh, March of 2017 is when we kicked off our Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign. So prior to that, we were kind of priming that pump um, with podcasts, but then we have also kind of staged a, a PR um, plan as well. So where we had a number of publications publishing uh, the story about our product launching and everything. And then the other piece I think is really the quality of the video that you're producing and the story that you're showing to um, your audience. So I think it's kind of a, a, a big combination of different things. And uh, we did it on a really, really low budget too, because it was all self-funded at that point. Yeah. And I, that's a good recommendation. I think you've got to have quality, um, but, but you don't want to spend too much budget if, if crowdfunding is there, because otherwise you might as well spend it up on the molds or whatever else you're, you're working on at the end of the day. We've seen so many people come through our doors that have started the crowdfunding route and maybe did so unsuccessfully, partially because they ran out of money in the early days because they spent too much, right? So you can have great quality video doing it a lot of it yourself, right? Or finding local resources, et cetera. And you know, I say that as a video producer, we do a lot of that, but our things are later stage, right? When you're going towards revenue, you got businesses that are that are there and now they've got budget to be able to afford it. But in the early days, 
do what you can to, to build that business, whether it's crowdfunding, whether it's PR for initial sales until your budgets grow to be able to afford, you know, true marketing to be really be able to scale. So later on in the process, you appeared on Shark Tank and that drove another quarter million dollars in revenues from the, the PR, the experience you had on there. Uh, any, any learnings from the Shark Tank experience you think would be helpful for our audience of other product marketers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in terms of the, the Shark Tank effect is absolutely real. If yeah. you show up on Shark Tank and it airs, um, you're going to see results. Uh, so that's, you know, the quarter million came in essentially in the two weeks after the airing. And we've done about that much that whole entire year leading up to that moment. So absolutely, Shark Tank effect is absolutely real. Uh, I would say if you think that your product is going to be successful on Shark Tank or might make make it to the show, I would say throw your hat in the ring and, and do it because that's essentially what we've done. I honestly didn't think that we were going to be making it on the show. A friend of mine applied to the show uh, when they were at CES in 2019. And then they told me like, hey, um, you know, there's all these casting calls all over the country. Just look one up close to you and go to that one. And uh, for me, it happened to be um, in Nebraska, which is not necessarily an entrepreneurial tech hub. So I think that um, the me appearing there was a little bit easier because I, I think they had fewer, maybe fewer options. I don't know, but honestly, just kind of you create your own luck by, by putting yourself out there. So try it. Why not? Yeah, no, love that. And you, know, you mentioned how you got a lot of that revenue in the two weeks since. A lot of the Shark Tank uh, success stories that I've interviewed on this show, and just we've, we've had a few clients go on, on the show as well, that revenue continues, right? It obviously goes down, right? But it's steady because reruns for that show run forever, right? They're, they're always on. So you get blips coming over and over again. And it's a credibility boost, just, even just to mention that, to put on your website, on your packaging, oh. et cetera, as well. So I agree. Absolutely. So- up until so this year, you've you've grown. Now you're at well over seven figures uh, in revenue annually, and grew fifty percent from last year. So you're in this high growth phase. What would you say if you could talk about a couple of the key marketing channels or or tactics that you've used that have been really especially successful for you? So we've been kind of doing a lot of different things, just trying to see what works because as an entrepreneur, I'm really new to this. This is at every step, you know, every, every single step is new to me. So I'm trying to learn from each one of the experiences. So uh, last year we've done a lot of different trade shows. And I think that that helped get our exposure out there um, for, for our products. A lot of people, go to a website and they have never seen this technology and they don't really know what they're looking at, how heavy it is. So some people need to hold it and see it in person. So I think that that's been effective this year. Um, that kind of didn't happen for a variety of different reasons. Some of the trade shows that we were planning on attending, they got canceled. So instead we decided to focus on our e-com channel and, and doing so we, um, tapped into email marketing. Um, personally, we, we didn't do a whole lot of email marketing in 2021. Uh, we started doing email marketing in 2022. We've seen really great results from that. Um, obviously like Facebook ads, Instagram ads, Google search ads. I think that those are important. They're kind of like a base foundational layer, I would say. Um, in addition to that, I would also say doing podcasts, anything that really gets you kind of out there and gets you exposure. Um, but also kind of trying to think of where your audience might be, what, what they might be listening to, watching you or whatever. So the other thing that I think has been really successful that's been paying dividends over time is just having influencers on uh, YouTube, um, Instagram, kind of promoting our products. And a lot of the motorcycle culture is really well connected together. There's a lot of different um uh, forums, different YouTube channels that a lot of people follow. And if, you know, if you happen to be on some of those and your product is actually up to snuff, people actually think that it's a good idea, you know, then it will take off. So I think the main thing is have a great product because, you know, pushing a product that's not a, you know, a great fit, that's going to be an uphill battle regardless of what you're doing. Um, but then after that, you know, I would say, you know, obviously Facebook ads, Instagram ads, Google um, podcasts, you know, influencer marketing, all that kind of stuff, everything yeah. kind of feeds into itself. These, this is all great advice. Um, and I think 
one of the key points is to not focus on just one thing, right? In every business, it can be a little bit different what's going to work and a combination approach can, can lead you to a much greater success and do some work more quickly as well, testing, learning along the way. One of the things you mentioned was email marketing. Where where have you found success? So I get a lot of questions for our audience on, okay, it sounds great, but how do I do it? Like, do you purchase lists? Do you go off visitors from your site that give you their email? Like how specifically has email marketing worked for you? Um, well, for us, because we didn't do email marketing for the first two years of the business, we've kind of accumulated about 20,000 subscribers to the email that have never seen an email from us other than just small updates about like, hey, this uh, uh, pre-order is going to be arriving on this date or like very transactional kind of things. And that was just personal limitation of my thinking that like I get annoyed by email marketing. Therefore, I think my customers will get annoyed. So I will not send email marketing messages. And um, over time, I've kind of got over that, decided to give it a try. And uh, we signed up with an email marketing agency that uh, really understood our needs and took the time to kind of learn our um, our customers. And we worked together to create some really good content together. So I think that that's uh, been effective, but I've never purchased lists. I don't really know how effective it is. So I can't really speak to that. Um, I feel like, you know, to me that might work if, if it's a targeted enough list. But um, honestly, for us, it's just been our own customers or people that are signing up to our own list. Yeah. And that's every, everyone I've ever asked that question to says exactly that. Like purchase lists, I, I, like you said, maybe there's a way to do it. I, I have not seen it work personally or through our clients. Um, you know, and I, you talk about how we're sometimes hesitant to market, whether it's email or in other ways, or communicate with our, our audience, our subscribers, et cetera. Like, I think the key is, no marketing is annoying to the correct audience, right? So if they're big fans of you most, and if they've given you their email address, not everybody, but a lot of them are going to be fans of your product, of you, of your business. So they're happy to hear from you if you do it in the right way, right? And messaging is part of that, right? So audience, of course, is part of that, but it's it's a it's a game to play really, right? Figure out if you've got low, high unsubscribe rates from an email, like, okay, change that tactic, uh, et cetera, as, as you go. But But to not be hesitant as well, realize that, Everyone, our audience wants to hear from us if they're our audience, right? If they are, if they really resonate with us. And think about that, I would say to our audience in your own life, as you scroll through Facebook, as you get emails, the ones you open, that's marketing too, right? Like you don't think of those as annoying because you want that product, you like that business or whatever. Same thing for you know Facebook and other other platforms as well. So it's just finding that right audience and and communicating to them. So that's that's all been great. Um what what resources have been helpful to you along the way that uh, have kind of helped along your journey? Uh, can you elaborate which, uh, what kind of resources? Yeah, like any kind of, any kind of book or a podcast or, or an event that has been helpful for you to, to learn, you know, in the early days or, or as you grow your business. For sure. Well, I mean, there's been a lot that have contributed, uh, you know, there's at every stage, you know, I feel like there's a different book and a different podcast that might be helpful. So for example, when I was getting ready for crowdfunding, I was doing a lot of research online, like what are the successful campaigns? What are the like podcasts that talk to successful crowdfunders and stuff like that? So if you're in that space, I would say like um, Crowd Crooks was a really great podcast for me at that time. Uh, they talked to a lot of uh, successful crowdfunders that have a lot of different methods of what might work. So you kind of piece that together. Um, I was listening to a lot of Entrepreneur on Fire um, at the time as well as talking to a lot of successful people that are kind of given sharing their advice. And then um, I was also in my 20s, so I didn't really know anything. So I was just like, yeah, give me all that information. Um, in terms of book recommendations, I think we're creatures of our habits and having the right habits in place is really crucial. So I would say uh, Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg has been really um, helpful um, to just nail down your routines, get how to get rid of habits that you don't want and how to structure and build the habits that will eventually pay dividends over time for a lot. Yeah. So that would be my recommendation. Love it. And, and like you said, like, it depends on what stage we're at with our business, right? Some of the resources we'll love for a couple of years, right? And then we grow past it and, and find another one along the way. And that's okay, right? But it's it's good to focus on the, the right stage of your life, the right stage of your business and finding the connection to, again, book, podcast, or or a person or, or whatever it might be to really help in your journey. Well, Alex, is there anything I didn't ask that you think would be helpful for our audience? No, I think you've covered a lot of ground here. So yeah, no, I don't think so. 
Well, hey, I really appreciate the time. This has been a fun interview. Again, I encourage our audience, please go check out breakfreetech.com. Check out Alex's business, his product. It's super cool, a lovely product. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, but it solves a big problem for, for motorcycle riders out there. So even if you're not a rider, go check out his website to learn a little bit about how he's done his marketing. Uh, if you're driving or riding a motorcycle while you're listening to the podcast, you'll see it in the show notes when you get back home too. So breakfreetech.com. And he's provided a, a promo code. So if you use Harvest Growth, all one word, uh, you'll get a $10 discount off any purchase off of his, his website. So Alex, again, really appreciate the time today. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, John. Appreciate it. Be sure to visit breakfreetech.com to learn more about our guest's product. You're going to love it. Also, if you have need for help with your business to learn how to grow your consumer product or service business, be sure to check out harvestgrowth.com. You can listen to hundreds of episodes of our podcast. We've got blog articles on there, a bunch of resources to really help you to grow your business and harvest the growth potential of your product or service. 